When Ryan's when it's time to begin, it's on the review but round with John Pollock and waiting the A team that makes sense of these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's review around for Monday night, then load a Tuesday morning from the Fight Network site. It's review around for Monday night on USA now on the John and Wade take the mic. Welcome to another edition of Review Raw. I am John Pollock alongside Wei Ting. Thank you for tuning in. It is review time. A special international edition of Raw. What do you mean? They were in Manchester, England. Oh, okay. okay. Not every day that they well, we go are, overseas. We are, we're, it's not like we're anywhere different. We're well, still here. It's a very domestic version of Review Raw to review the international version of Raw. Got it. One of only two times a year where they go overseas for this little episode. Did you read anything ahead of Raw? I read the brackets for the tournament, but beyond that, I knew that it would affect my interest in the show. Um, and, you know, I really need my interest in the show <laughs> in order for me to pay attention. So I stopped reading the spoilers. What was your reaction to the brackets? I was a little disappointed. I mean, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of discussion about who, what surprises they might bring in, whether it be an NXT guy or maybe, you know, a... Uh, uh, potentially staying or, or maybe even some names from the past that that, that were out there. Uh, and when I saw the brackets, the, you know, pretty much the current roster, there was a little bit of disappointment. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about the brackets once they're actually uh, play into the actual episode. But Raw began with the WWE title on display in the middle of the ring, all by its lonesome. It looked very, very lonely, this title, without a holder. And Triple H comes out. As Michael Cole explains, the injury suffered by Seth Rollins last Wednesday in Dublin, Ireland, the first night of the European tour and gone six to nine months. And they've somewhat changed the wording because originally when the injury happened, uh, they stated a tournament would take place at Survivor Series to crown a new champion. Now the tournament is going to culminate at Survivor Series. We're probably thinking the final four would probably be at Survivor Series. Well, the semifinals are supposed to take place next week, aren't they? Quarterfinals. The quarterfinals. There's are four next rounds. Week. Gotcha. Okay, okay. So I imagine quarterfinals next week, and then semis and finals at Survivor Series. That's sure. probably what we're looking at. Which I wouldn't have been adverse to doing, you know, three rounds at the Survivor Series. You think so? Because that... all these other guys are just going to be thrown into random matches. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. But I, I, I'm thinking just for, for the like even for the King of the Ring when they used to do that on pay per view in in, 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 in in the later years, they would only do the three matches, you know, so per perhaps they have other plans. Um, they made sure to give Coach the credit here on this. Uh, oh, story. that's going to be a regular thing. For yeah, them. and and I think that's something notable too. The fact that they had Coach Jonathan Coachman uh, tweet out the news, being the first one to do it, and on will TV, they do this the next time uh, Dave Meltzer breaks something? Will they give him credit on the air? Um, I doubt that. <laughs> I highly doubt that. But obviously, all all in an effort to co-promote with ESPN, giving Coach the the scoop. The scoop. He broke the news. He knew even before the WWE. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. He probably called them. Yeah. Hunter was treated like a total babyface by this Manchester crowd, chanting his name. He takes a moment to acknowledge a great champion in Seth Rollins. He exceeded all expectations. And then the fans boo when Hunter says he's no longer the champion. I yeah. imagine there was a fan or two maybe that had no clue what they were walking into at Raw and realizing, oh, my God, we, we don't have a champion. Not in England. I, I think that's doubtful. Like I, I would sometimes, if that were the case, I I always like trying to figure, you know, think of, thinking about the the conversations that fans would have with each other at the shows before the uh, before the shows actually start, because it always seems like whenever a story like like this breaks off air, the crowds always know the day of. Like you know, when WCW was bought by the WWF. Everybody knew before the show started. You know, like every time some insider story breaks. Everybody at the show already knows, seemingly. Yeah. I could have done without Hunter. I mean, you obviously, this is one of those cases. Sit back. Let's see where the story goes. Mm -hmm. I didn't want Hunter to acknowledge Rollins. Really? Why? I want that to be the program. That needs to be the whole motivation for Rollins' turn. Is that he was dumped. Acknowledge as in praising him? You didn't want him praising him? Obviously yeah. At the time I wanted time. Hunter to be out, and he's already looking to the, to the next guy, and it's it's life after Rollins. There's no acknowledgement uh, of the guy that went down hurt. You obviously have to mention him. Of course mention him, but yeah. I don't need to see him put him over. If that's the feud you're going to be going They're to. still going to go to that feud, and I don't think that really well, get, get, Plant the seed now. 
Uh, perhaps. Like basically, you wanted Hunter to basically talk about how Rollins failed. I liked I liked him shifting focus and immediately recruiting Roman Reigns, yep. but I want I really think that could be a big program coming back Rollins for Rollins. And Triple H. In fact, I think that should be the first program before Rollins even goes for the title again. Yeah, perhaps. And that that could be SummerSlam next year, mm-hmm. whenever the timetable is. Mm-hmm. Hunter says that the tournament starts tonight, a 16 man tournament, and he brings out Roman Reigns. And, of course, Roman Reigns was the number one contender for the Survivor Series. And he says how it's unfair that Reigns does have to start all the way back at square one and go through all of these people in the tournament. And he offers an option for Roman Reigns where he can sit back and face the winner of the tournament at Survivor Series for the vacant title. And says that back when he was recruiting Rollins, he strongly considered picking Roman Reigns. And says that Roman has everything. Size, speed, charisma. I don't know about that one. But Rollins would do anything to be champion, and that's why Reigns hasn't been champion yet. And Hunter says, if you want to be the man, Roman, all you have to be, all you have to do is be my man. Be my man. Be my man. How romantic. And then Roman says he doesn't want to be a sellout. Hunter explains the meaning of the word sellout. It's a word created for those that don't succeed that use it to explain how others do succeed. Good good lines, I thought. I thought this opening promo, I thought Hunter was yep. great. Absolutely. For a guy that carried this 15-minute promo. Mm-hmm. Roman had 15 words, maybe, oh, max. It could have been a cardboard cutout of Roman Reigns. And Hunter was very good in this opening segment, I yep. thought. And this did not drag for 15 minutes mm-hmm. either. Nope. It explained everything. It was a great angle where he was making all these valid points to recruit Roman Reigns. Yep. And if there was a negative, it was like Roman just looked like – he looked just silly standing he, there and no. trying to emote. Roman was fine. If anything, if, if you got him to do too much, he might have ruined it. But him just standing there looking the way he did, I thought he was fine. So he then explains to Roman that criticism comes with the territory, places the title on Reigns shoulder, and the crowd booed this. This, this sacrilege. Uh, that's I thought that was a tremendous visual, you know, like the, the whole – the whole thing is that, you know, you don't want your champions to even touch the title until they've actually earned it. And for, for Triple H to actually put the title on him, I thought, was a great added touch. Is this, is this going to be like a Lord of the Rings theme where now he's he's felt my precious? I'll tell you and what. And it's going to corrupt his mind. Well, I'll tell you what's interesting, like you bring that up. My, my roommate and I, uh, we, we decided to uh, watch all the Star Wars movies in, in preparation for uh, oh God. The, the Force Awakens. And so this past weekend, we struggled through the prequels. This was like uh, episode one was a real chore, but by the I've time never you, seen it. You've never seen any of them. I've never seen Phantom oh, Menace. You should have joined us, but but you you know what? Just skip it or, or just watch the last twenty minutes because <laughs> okay. that pod race scene like you'll you won't make it through. I fell asleep multiple times, uh, but anyway, <laughs> so he woke up and then fell asleep again. Yeah, wow. Yeah, but you know uh, by the by the time you get to episode three, uh, you get to a scene where the Emperor is trying to convince Anakin Skywalker to join the dark side. And I felt this was obviously very much, you know, that same type of storyline. I thought it was every bit as good as that, honestly. Triple I, I like this opening talk. segment a lot. I thought yeah. this was one of the best Hunter segments in months. Mm-hmm. And says that this will set up generations of his family monetarily. Just be my man. <laughs> and Reigns tells him to shove his offer. And Hunter thanks him for reminding him why he didn't choose him and went with Rollins. And that's when we get the announcement of the 16-man tournament with matches taking place tonight and on SmackDown this week. And one thing will be clear. If everyone who is throwing out this idea that Roman ends up winning this tournament and then is revealed as the corporate champion, it makes no logical sense that he would choose to go through these four guys when he was given this True. opportunity. Yes. So let's just uh, earmark this segment. Let's remember this segment. Doesn't mean because they... in two weeks, <laughs> it might not mean anything. It doesn't mean they won't do it. But... I, do, I know it doesn't. I'm saying this so people try and remember it. Much like Kevin Owens, who is uh, owed a favor by Seth Rollins, which that better be cashed in next year. Each week on Review of Raw, pay attention for the secret question. You can tweet the answer at Law Radio every week for your chance to win a t-shirt from Pro Wrestling Tees. Next week on Impact Wrestling, 
The World Title Series heats up as Matt Hardy continues his quest to regain the gold as he faces Eddie Edwards in group tag team competition. Plus, the reigning TNA Knockouts champion, Gail Kim, battles Madison Rain in a must-win group match for both knockouts. And in the group champion's main event, Ethan Carter III clashes with Mr. Anderson. Despite being eliminated from the series, can Anderson play spoiler and cost EC3 his chance to advance? It's all next week on Impact Wrestling. Roman Reigns and Big Show kicked off this tournament. What a stamp to start this with a 15-minute Big Show Roman match. It, it is what it is, but I'll say from a storyline perspective, the Big Show was the perfect opponent here. You know, Reigns is portrayed as someone who could have taken the easy route. He didn't take it, and now he's paying for it by getting slowly beaten up by Triple H's giant goon. You know, this is not the time to have a, a great back and forth with Callisto or, or Neville, but, you know, the Big Show... I thought was was a good choice. Unfortunately, it, it, this crowd valued in-ring quality a lot more. Let's go over these brackets before we start going through the matches. In the first uh, side of the bracket, we have Reigns against Show, Cesaro, Sheamus, Alberto Del Rio against Stardust, and Ryback against Kalisto. Mm -hmm. How Kalisto got into this tournament, I can't tell you. I don't know either. Then on the other side, Kevin Owens against Titus O'Neil. Neville against Bad News Barrett, Dolph Ziggler against The Miz, and Dean Ambrose against Tyler Breeze, mm -hmm. who <laughs> will have his first televised match on the main roster going for this title. Now, you can be very underwhelmed by these brackets. I said this last week. If they put a 16-man tournament together, it's going to really shine a light on how little depth they have. This is what you've got to work with. And I understand, oh, there's no names from the past. That's not the answer to the larger issues they're facing. They're going full tilt with this is who they've got. Yep. They chose to do a 16-man tournament because they've got TV time to fill. Yeah. I mean, I, I, this, I, this is what it is. Yeah. And in hindsight, in a 16-man tournament, you're going to have 15 losers. And would you want to bring back a Chris Jericho or a Sting or, or whoever? You know, just to have no, lose. no. You need guys like you know Callisto who could basically afford the loss. Like it's not a great solution. Like it, re Callisto is in your title tournament. It, it, in the end, it's just a SmackDown match, or it's just the Raw match. You know? It comes down to there's four key guys that will be a part of this tournament mm -hmm. at the Survivor Series. Reigns and Big Show. Uh, Cole said that the last man standing match that these two had at Extreme Rules was one of the matches that put Roman Reigns on the map this year. Okay. I don't know if I'd put that on the level of like which headlining match, WrestleMania. Which match? Which match? Uh, the one that put him on the map, boy. <laughs> it was the month after WrestleMania. What map is this? <laughs> it was actually a very good match they had, yeah. to be fair. Reigns can't lift up Big Show. They went through a commercial break. Show applied a bear hug, escaped with a Samoan drop. Show got hit at one point with a boot and had this mark under his left eye that looked, uh, it looked like either a swelling or this giant pimple that was under his left eye and it just looked utterly painful both, both of those things don't sound good yeah I mean, if it popped it could have been just a travesty I mean, big sh yeah. anyway the crowd just magically woke up at some point during this match where i feel there was like a cable that was loose with the crowd miking because it, it almost felt that way the entire night well the, after this point yes like yeah. other than the closing angle this was not your typical England crowd that is usually so lively. And what I look forward to on some of these tape shows is the crowd. Mm -hmm. This was not one of them. Yeah, in this in the match in the case of this match, I think it was probably they reflected how I felt at home. To they, be fair, they weren't that impressed with the match until Reigns did uh, some of his comebacks. Think of the expectation some of these fans probably had going to this show, because it was. It was limitless. Yeah. There's so many different ways they could go here. And this was a pretty conservative tournament bracket that they put together yeah. with no outside names. It was about as, you know, in the box as you could probably envision. Mm -hmm. uh, match finished with uh, Reigns hitting the drive-by. The Superman punch was stopped as Big Show caught him with a choke slam, but then Reigns came back, hit the Superman punch, and speared him. Roman Reigns advances in the tournament. What a shock. Wow. I think he could go all the way. <laughs> Uh, then we had the announcers who got cut off with the first of many uh, video packages 
This was all built building towards a, a Bray Wyatt segment to close the show where he would pay his respects to The Undertaker and Kane, and they would show these video highlights contrasting an Undertaker moment with a Kane moment with nothing to do with one another. It was just two random moments no, in their no. careers. Well, in this case, it was they're their both. Uh, their this debuts. one actually did have a thematic uh, connection to it, but most of them did not. They're just highlights. A lot well, of highlights. The first we had uh, The Undertaker's debut from 1990 at the Survivor Series. And then we had Kane's debut from Bad Blood. What was funny about this was they used the, the Bad Blood logo that they would use in future years because at the event Kane debuted at, it was when they spelt bad with two Ds. <laughs> and it's just stupid. <laughs> that. And then when they brought the pay-per-view <laughs> back, they spelt it the correct way and they used the correct <laughs> logo for this. That's so weird. And then we went into some After Effects treatment with the Wyatt's Thunder and Lightning promo uh, plugging their paying tribute segment for later tonight. We got some praise for the video game with quotes, which were some of the funniest reviews ever. It was like all the quotes had these qualifiers in them, uh, such as best we've seen in a long time, undisputedly the best WWE title to come from 2K which only covers like three games. Three, yeah. And then another guy, 8.8 .8 out of 10. So they'll take oh the praise where God. they can get it. Okay. Well, I played the Best game. Best game to come out this month. <laughs> I played the game this weekend. Oh, actually, did you? Yeah. How is it? It's just like all the previous years. I, I was not really into like wrestling video games in, uh, since 2000. Like 2000, man. Like when, when I played SmackDown 2. Uh, on Back at the, uh, the Undertaker's on 10th anniversary on PlayStation, and this this game like felt the, like the same game. Like I was kind of disappointed at how little. Wait, one of these quotes said it's the next best thing to sitting in the arena live. <laughs> are you disputing that? <laughs> these are reputable Maybe sitting, sources. Sitting in the arena live isn't that great then, because I found myself pretty frustrated. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll do, we're actually going to do something for the Fight Network. I think. How so are we? Be on the lookout. For that. Okay. <laughs> Log on to FightNetwork.com daily for podcasts from live audio wrestling covering the entire industry on a daily basis. Wayne Rooney from Manchester United. I think that's a golf team. <laughs> yes, and so wait, wait for all the hate mail that you're, you're going to get. It's uh, that comment. You can send it now to yeah. uh, at Law Radio. Yeah, yeah. Kevin Owens and Titus O'Neil were next up in the tournament. Owens came out with a new T-shirt and was given promo time. This was clearly this was a new shirt. Another this one? was a new shirt. Yeah, oh, okay. he po I pointed out his shorts also come with pockets in them. You can buy his theme on iTunes. He says change is what WWE needs. And the crowd agrees with us, and the fans start cheering when Owen says that they've been cheering the same old garbage for years. And then he panders to the British, saying that they are better than that and think they're the smartest fans when, in fact, they're probably the dumbest because they worship a false idol that knocks the entire monarchy system and says he is about to change the WWE, but only to benefit himself. And it will be the Kevin Owens show when he is the WWE and IC champion. This was one guy that felt like with all these changes, they have confidence in. They gave him a promo, and this guy came across as someone on this show. And I can't say that about too many people on this particular show. But Owens, I thought, had a great outing. Absolutely. I, and I'm sure Kevin Owens himself sees this as his opportunity right now to really make an impression. I'm sure he knows that he's being considered to take over that top heel role. And I'm sure he's now more focused than ever at in trying to impress the you know everybody with all of his perfor performances from this point forward. If you're talking about the candidates to be the top heel without flipping a baby face and you have Kevin Owens and Alberto Del Rio and you contrast those two tonight, oh I don't even want to say night and day because that's not doing justice. There is not a 12-hour difference between these two. It is like daylight in Japan and night in Vancouver. It is so far apart where these two are it's right It's not now. actually that far apart. You're right. It's actually, that's <laughs> fairly close. I should have gone uh, like, uh, like Nova Scotia. Africa or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Titus came out. He did not get any promo time. 
He did get to catch Owens with a boot. They went through a commercial break. O'Neal hit this pump handle spinning slam, and then Owens sends him up and sends O'Neal off the ropes, catches him with a pop-up powerbomb, and pins him. And then he puts JBL's hat on as some fans were starting to chant for JBL during this match, and Owens advances. Owens, like, he does a lot of babyface things. And I'm, you know, I, I, I'm sure, obviously he's a great heel, but I really wonder if they have a lot of uh, sights set on him being a babyface very soon. You know, I, I'm sure a lot of these things aren't done by coincidence. Um Titus actually, they mentioned that he he had like some presentation this week, and with this and also the, like the the breast cancer stuff, he's actually a lot of mainstream press, but none of that seems to have resulted in any type of push on TV for him. No, uh, someone that they can send out there. I don't think that necessarily means you have to push him as a top guy. Not even necessarily a top guy, but just as somebody with some type how, of role. How did he get into this tournament uh, over Darren? I don't know. He is sort of, he's been the, the, the bigger leader in the group, I'd say. Because he's taller? He talks more. Okay. I, I don't know, but I feel like they sh- they could capitalize a little bit more on some of the attention that he's been getting. Here, he just basically played an, a jobber and sort of an awkward one at that because Owens was pretty much a baby face in this whole thing. Did, from just a pure storyline perspective, not obviously actual logistical issues, that is, does it not hurt this tournament that there is no explanation for why Brock has nothing to do with this tournament? Mm, like, I don't think so. Like he's above this tournament. But it feels I think like. I the think title is vacant. Shouldn't that be your ultimate goal? I don't Some know. explanation. The people are just missing. People, you know, people aren't saying why. Why people aren't even asking why Cena's gone. You know what I mean? They never gave an explanation about that. I, I think the audience. That should have been done. That should have been yep. the next night he suffered a concussion at the yeah. the foot of Alberto Del Rio. But I feel like the lo- audience now large, largely knows not to a- ask those questions because they know Brock only works limited dates because they know Cena is taking time off. Like, you know, I don't think it really hurts. See, I think, I think that's going to make it even more of a challenge when you know that the main guys aren't around for this tournament and a, and a Brock, mm-hmm. like, there's no explanation. Oh, it's like, why oh. Is it, why isn't The Undertaker in this? Hey, these are all questions. Like, the biggest people on no, this show no, that really were in the final segment are not going for the title. No one, really, no one's really asking, in my opinion. They were the main event of this show. Why is Bray not going after the title? They're, they're busy. Or, you know, he's got other <laughs> stuff going on this week. Renee is with Paige backstage and asks if she thinks Paige may have awoken a dragon in Becky Lynch. And I immediately thought Becky was going to swoop in with wings into this segment. Or a breathing fire. Yes. Ricky Steamboat. Paige calls her a rat, which she calls was... Calls Renee a rat? or Calls Becky a rat. Oh, okay, right. And actually, she was born in 1987 and would therefore be a rabbit. <laughs> you and I are rats. You and I are rats, yes. And says, <laughs> Paige says she is going to take out the B, and at Survivor Series, it will just be the C. Ooh, wow. I thought this was funny. Uh, in contrast to last, last week's promo that Becky focused on, I, I think being called a C is something worth getting upset about. Maybe not in England, but certainly in North America. You know, you can't call women Cs. Renee, uh, uh, they finished the segment, and then we go to our next video, which was The Undertaker winning his, I guess, uh, second WWF title. Maybe this, do- this actually does connect because Undertaker defeats Psycho Sid even though it was almost positioned as this was Undertaker's first title win when it was not. Mm. He beat Hogan. And then, oh, interesting. And then they cut to Kane winning the world title, which also wasn't his first title because he beat Austin for that 24-hour title reign <laughs> in 98. So maybe this was all we're forgetting first reigns and we're just moving on to the second ones. Could be. Uh, this was when Kane knows? cashed in the Money in the Bank briefcase on Rey Mysterio the same night he won the briefcase in 2010. Paige and the B were next. Charlotte was watching backstage, and Lynch got placed into a tree of woe, and then Paige pulled her arms back. Paige was just attacking her, then got hit with a T-bone suplex, and then this match got really weird. Paige hit the rampage to Becky way into the corner to where— That was done on purpose, though, It so, was so that Becky could grab the ropes. Becky grabs the ropes, yeah. but then it was this awkward transition, and— Paige goes for the PTO, and as she's leaning over, one of them, and I'm pretty sure it was Paige because I watched this four times, said, I'm sorry, which I'm pretty sure. 
Yeah, there that's was what a, it sounded like. There was a bit of a screw up with, with the finish with the, with the PTO, but I thought the rest of the match was actually pretty good, and I was surprised that this crowd was as dead as they were for a lot of it. I think they were confused of how to react to Paige, who very much played a babyface to this crowd, even though she was the heel. From this PTO onward, I thought it was just a weird, clunky finish. And it ended with Paige then going for an O'Connor roll, and Becky reversed it, and Becky pins Paige. Mm -hmm. I guess because Paige is just banned from winning in her uh, home country, much like uh, Neville would be as well on this show. And Becky, who's not going for the title, beats Paige, who is. So if that's yeah. not a three-way, I don't know why this happened. Uh, very true. <laughs> very true. Yeah, they're this all is an easy one. Paige victory. Yep. And so what if the crowd cheers her for one night? Yeah, this is a, a case of uh, even Steven booking that uh, I don't know if it'll, it'll necessarily pay off. They announced the match. It'll be, it's Paige versus Charlotte. Yeah, they've announced it. So unless yep. they change it to a three-way, this made no sense. Yeah. I'm not sure. And then, just to negate the win, Paige then killed her afterwards, applied the PTO on the announce desk, and then Charlotte ran out for the save. Does it hurt more on, on top of a desk? <laughs> it's at elevation. Like, when she cleared the table, and, and you know, this crowd got really excited for the first time in the match. <laughs> Why wouldn't you hit the rampage <laughs> on the desk? Like, that I could understand, but, the, like, a submission? Yeah. Be like, I, it's like, I get you on the table, and I headlock you. I was like, <laughs> no! <laughs> no! <laughs> This week on Review Away, we are going back to November of 1999 for November to Remember, presented by Extreme Championship Wrestling. Catch Mike Awesome against Masato Tanaka for the ECW Championship, Taz's final match for ECW against Rob Van Dam, and much more from the ECW November to Remember show in Buffalo, New York. Next week on the WWE Network, it's Undertaker Week. That should be fun. Yeah. Going through some angles. They, they, show, they were showing clips from this like roundtable discussion that Austin, uh, Michaels. Michaels, Hunter, and JBL were all part of. And I'll, I'll definitely watch that. That looks interesting. And then they uh, showed a video of WrestleMania tickets going on sale. And then our next tournament match, The Miz and Dolph Ziggler. The last time these two had a TV match was uh, Halloween week where The Miz got a pumpkin placed on his head. Now they're fighting for the title. Ziggler was selling his left knee. He got tossed off by Miz, landing on the bad knee. Crowd was utterly dead during this mm -hmm. match. Figure four into a roll-up by Ziggler for a two-count. Then Miz reapplies to figure four. Rope break, and Ziggler catches him with a super kick. Five minutes, and Ziggler advances. Again, I thought this match was good, too. I mean, was it anything special? No, but it was technically sound. But I guess that simply wasn't enough for this crowd, and who I'm sure could tell that neither of these men were going to win. None of them had any mic time. I don't even. Did they even get entrances? They got entrances at least, right? Well, Miz, they, they were, came back and he was pretty much in the ring, and then Ziggler right. got his entrance. But I was just surprised at how how quiet this crowd was for this. The next clip was from the 2005 Survivor Series, one of the great Survivor Series in in history. I got a lot of flack last what, week. What happened? Uh, you know, it was it was an important show. Oh, yes. that I've overlooked. The writing was tremendous. Hey, I never. I yeah. hey, it's. Uh, <laughs> Orton pinned Michaels. This is the same clip we saw last week, which was weird. And then The Undertaker. This was not a run-in. This was like a explosion-in. He came out of like a, a, an upright casket and scared the hell out of Randy Orton. And then that naturally segued into Daniel Bryan and Kane as a comedy tag team winning the tag titles at Night of Champions 2012. Yeah, if, both, when I think of Survivor Series 2005, I also think of Night of Champions 2012. They both happened. They both yeah. happened. Yeah. You're right. They both happened. Sure. Maybe they were in the same city. Who knows? I have no clue. Yeah. Then we had probably the worst segment of the night. Alberto Del Rio came out with Zeb Coulter. Coulter says that America and, and Mexico should work together, and they would have asked the English to join, but they are so despised around the world. Says Germany already tells you what to do. And then you're complaining about refugees, and even Scotland doesn't want anything to do with you. And Zeb says he wouldn't be surprised if one day Vladimir Putin is telling them what to do. Refers to the fans as haters. Mentions Del Rio's tournament match. Del, Del Rio. Sir. Del Rio called them haters. Yeah, this was Del Rio, like Del Rio for for the first time in a while. I mean, he did speak, but I, I 
the whole this whole idea of like pairing a mouthpiece with Del Rio, I think you know it obviously comes from maybe a bit of a uh, a lack of confidence in his speaking ability, which I don't think was really his problem. And in fact, like his push here, he really didn't need this type of mouthpiece, in my opinion. But so we get a chance here to actually hear Alberto <laughs> Del Rio speak. You what haters! Does he, what does he say? He, <laughs> He says this place is popular. He used a term that's popularized by 14 year old high school he kids. He says this place, referring to England, is only populated by haters. Ooh. What, what kind of an insult is that? Especially in England, where like every other word is a cuss word. It was so Hate. sad that they were trying to just play off of like nationalistic like unrest here by throwing around uh, Germany telling you what to do, Putin, Scotland. And nothing. It was like this crowd was like, really? That's the best you've got to get heat. It was so lame. And then the tournament matches on SmackDown where Del Rio will become the first Mex-American champion. I thought this sucked. Del Rio simply is not clicking at all here. And, you know, we're, what are we, like two weeks in now from his return? And he's just right back. The swagger him. program's dropped, it feels like. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that would have helped at all. But he's right back to being a mid-card heel at best. I think this gimmick is just, they need to be aborting this right now. Over the last year, Ring of Honor, AAA, and Lucha Underground did 20 times a better job getting this guy across as a star in the limited time they had. And WWE uh, squandered him in two nights. Mm -hmm. Brought him in so hot that night at Hell in a Cell. And by the next night, it was nothing. And, and this is really no no um, you know fault of Zebs, who I think continues to do a very good role playing that type of character, but not with Del this Mex America thing. Just it's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> this Sunday night on Live Audio Wrestling, we're going to be joined by former WWE creative member and the co-executive producer of Lucha Underground, Chris De Joseph. We're going to be chatting about season one and what to look forward to in season two. It's Live Audio Wrestling Sunday night at midnight Eastern. Natalia and Naomi. Natalia was encouraging fans to chant, we want Sasha. I, yeah, that was weird to me. The idea is that by the fans chanting, we want Sasha, Team Bad is going to self-destruct. Okay. So that the B and the A will be upset with the D. They're certainly trying to kind of push that slightly with, with Sasha, uh, you know, getting all the attention in the team, but... They don't. They haven't really sold it within the team themselves. I mean, Team Bad. If you just look at them, they they continue to work together. There doesn't seem to be any tease of dissent within the team at all. They did a brief little shoving match on SmackDown. It was very minor. But nothing tonight. But then nothing on Raw, and that's a big part of your audience. Natalia was on the floor. Sasha shoved her into the post. Then Natalia avoids the rear view, shoves Naomi into Tamina on the apron, and rolls her up in two minutes and seven seconds and then afterwards they attack natalia she avoids the bank statement applies the sharpshooter when tamina super kicks natalia and then sasha applies the bank statement and they put the glasses onto natalia <laughs> yeah i mean sasha you know in contrast to that to that page uh, becky match was getting a ton of great reaction from this crowd everything that she was doing was was getting cheers from this audience and it's just so strange to me that i think they're so hungry for that that female talent that you know is connecting with its audience right right now, and it's Sasha Banks. But instead, they're putting her in the background while they focus on PCB, and it, putting her in the background in a role that's kind of messy. Is she a babyface? Is she a heel? Um, I'm sure they have other plans for her down the line, but I worry that this crowd won't be chanting "We want Sasha forever," and I feel like the time is is now to do something with her. Our next uh, series of clips, The Undertaker and Kane, the theme was Under the Ring, where The Undertaker and Edge, their Hell in a Cell match from 2008 was shown, which ended with Edge being sent through the ring to the depths of hell, and then it erupted in flames. We all know the pathway to hell is through the... (laughs) Through an arena ring (laughs) in Indianapolis. And then we cut to the Lita Edge wedding from 2005, where Kane comes from under... The ring from the depths of hell and tombstone the priest. I did enjoy that entire wedding and storyline with Kane, Edge, and Lita. 
And then King Barrett is going to be on ESPN Tuesday night and probably talking about this angle that they shot. It was Sheamus with Barrett in his corner against Cesaro. And during the break, Barrett cut a promo on Wayne Rooney. And the match began. There was an uppercut that knocked Sheamus off the apron. Sheamus had an Irish curse backbreaker. Uh, They had a a very good match, I thought. And the crowd was into this. The Cesaro swing got stopped when Sheamus grabbed the bottom rope. And then a suplex sent both over, crashing to the floor, which didn't look fun. Back in the ring, uh, the white noise was hit. Cesaro kicked out. Then Cesaro came back, applied the sharpshooter, and Sheamus got the rope break. And then Cesaro drop kicked Sheamus from uh, who was seated on the top, like the Okada style like drop kick, and sent him to the floor. And then Cesaro slapping hands with Rooney, and Barrett then distracts Cesaro, allowing Sheamus to knock him from behind. And Barrett gets in Wayne Rooney's face, and Wayne Rooney slaps Barrett. And then Cesaro follows with the running uppercut. And then the inverted Chikara special cradle for the win and eliminates Sheamus. Is that what it's called? Yes. That's it's also it's called the, the Dos Caras Clutch. Okay. Who uh, is, uh, of course, uh, Del Rio's father who created it, as far as I know. And Cesaro wins, somewhat surprisingly. I thought they would go to Reigns and Sheamus in the second uh, round, but instead it'll be Reigns and Cesaro. A fresh match. I'm glad they decided on the on this outcome. I mean, Sheamus, I think we, we're we all expecting t- to do something, okay, at, at SummerSlam, whether it be a cash-in. Survivor or a, Series. Sorry, sorry, Survivor Series. Uh, I got my acronyms mixed up. But, you know, I think the... the 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 cash in is something that a lot of people are expecting, so y- y- we can hope for some type of tease. They can play with that a lot. He doesn't need to be in this tournament. And Cesaro, I think, is another guy who stands to gain a lot from this. All of a sudden, you know, refreshing of, of the main main roster. And here he got a big reaction, um, just like just incredibly acrobatic and and agile and powerful and somebody who's just getting over so well simply on the strength of his in-ring work and um, i hope that they finally see that you can keep the conversation going 24 hours a day on twitter facebook and instagram at law radio and you can also join the official law message board at lawradio.proboards.com next week on impact wrestling the world title series heats up as Matt Hardy continues his quest to regain the goal as he faces Eddie Edwards in group tag team competition. Plus, the reigning TNA Knockouts champion, Gail Kim, battles Madison Rain in a must-win group match for both knockouts. And in the group champion's main event, Ethan Carter III clashes with Mr. Anderson. Despite being eliminated from the series, can Anderson play spoiler and cost EC3 his chance to advance? It's all next week on Impact Wrestling. Graphic congratulating Batista on the new Spectre film. And then Breeze and Summer Rae are with Renee in the back. He's making his Raw debut. He says the world is obviously an ugly place, looking at Renee. And then they mock Ambrose's wardrobe. And Summer says he looks homeless. So this is Breeze's first TV match on the main roster. Ambrose takes him out with a dive on the floor, and they go through a commercial break. They're going back and forth. Breeze tries for the pin and is using the ropes for leverage, and Ambrose kicks out. And then Ambrose gets his shirt torn. He tore it himself. Oh, he tore it himself then. Is that, I guess that's open, that's a free the, move the, now. The other guy's not going to do it no. for a while. And then hit a missile drop kick from the top where either Ambrose has is really good with his selling, which I thought it was here. He was selling. Because they immediately then yeah. went to, he was grabbing the left shoulder yeah. and then Breeze immediately went to work over it. So I think it was just really well being sold i actually i, I was questioning the the previous match when uh cesaro uh land did that uh, oh to the floor the ring and yeah. he was favoring that elbow the entire time I, I wasn't sure if that was planned then there's a backcracker for a two count and then breeze moves to the fujiwara arm bar he's all in control gets sent to the floor returns and ambrose catches him with an inside cradle out of nowhere and ambrose beats breeze breeze uh tyler breeze's debut match on raw um you know, he in ring he looked good here. He showed some aggression, which a character like his really needs if he wants to avoid that kind of mid card jobber uh, label. But he shouldn't have been in this. He shouldn't have been in this tournament first of all because he's nowhere near um, you know uh, that that title picture. But secondly, him losing in the first round of uh, in a throwaway match like this just does con- way more harm than him just 
not being in the tournament. Just confirms that he's an undercard jobber. You know, his role in this tournament should have been somebody who to cost Dolph Ziggler the match, and then he could have broken off into his own program with Ziggler. As it stands right now with this outcome, you got nothing for Tyler Breeze coming out of this. So what it, was the point? Yeah, I I think that they tried to somewhat protect him in commentary, but to me, it's like if you value wins and losses, that's an easy explanation. He hasn't debuted yet. How can he qualify for this tournament? Simple. Just didn't need to be there and didn't need to be losing in the first round. They showed the uh, WrestleMania 28 Hell in a Cell with Undertaker and Hunter and then Kane's uh, 2001 Royal Rumble performance. And then they plugged the tournament matches for Thursday, Ryback, Kalisto, Neville Barrett, and Del Rio against Stardust. New Day come out asking why they were left out of the tournament. Great question. The crowd boos this and said not long ago they laid out Ziggler, their childhood favorites, the Dudley boys who have just gone missing. And the golden boy, John Cena, and says this match is for their fallen captain, Seth Rollins, and calls European magic garbage, and Harry Potter sucks. They reminded me here about that uh, that closing angle on Raw a few weeks back where they, they did lay out Cena and, and yeah, do all that. That's right. What happened to that? They, Nothing. It seemed like they were getting some type of main card push, and then all of a sudden... You Xavier know, went nothing. off and got married. Shouldn't have done that. The New Day took on Neville and the Usos. They got the advantage on Jay for a while until he was able to tag in Neville who was in with uh, Xavier. There were The Usos came in, super kicked Kofi and E to the floor, and then hit double topes. Woods then got drop kicked off the apron, and Neville hit this great-looking corkscrew moonsault. Woods then got sent back into the ring. Neville was on the top forever, and then finally hopped down, sent Woods back down to the mat, climbed back up, and I think Big E just missed his cue to trip him up. So then did it on the second try, and Woods pinned the guy from England using the ropes. And the New Day got the win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Neville probably should have won here. Um, but He's in the tournament. Yeah, true. Well, you know he's not going to win. Why did he have to take the fall here <laughs> in England? But he uh, he did, like, this tremendous, like, we- type of, like, Phoenix splash on- onto the floor that just looked incredible. I thought he, you know, despite losing, he got a good amount of shine in, in this. And then our final segment. Bray Wyatt comes out. He's by himself. The crowd is singing. He says, tonight we celebrate change and the spirits of the Undertaker and Kane. The earth shook at their feet, and they controlled the light and the darkness and tells everyone to bow their heads and pay respects to them. The crowd starts chanting the Undert- uh, Undertaker. Bray laughs, calling them fools, and will no longer pay respect to these relics. Says he took the torch and used it to burn Kane and Undertaker straight into ashes, and then says that the demons marched to Bray Wyatt's demand and that the apocalypse is here. And Bray gets on his knees, and then all of a sudden, a video package starts playing. Who's doing all this editing? Well, last week, this was Bray's video package. It was the exact same one. Same package. He shouldn't have been so stunned at seeing this package. It was the exact same one from last week. You got to see Chronic in this video. And it's all highlights of The Undertaker and Kane, mostly from 14 years ago. And then we hear The Undertaker's words over the loudspeaker, saying, rest in peace, and then the fire erupted from the turnbuckles and from the entranceway. The no lightning bolts. The Undertaker's gong hit and his music played. And the Undertaker and Kane walk out and this crowd lost their minds seeing these two. The lights are out as they enter the ring and then the Wyatts surround the ring. Kane and Undertaker send Harper and Rowan immediately to the floor. Strowman is standing there and confronts them. Then Harper and Rowan return to take a double choke slam. And then Strowman gets, uh, he double clotheslines Taker and Kane, who immediately sit up, send Strowman to the floor and over the announce desk, and then they return and double choke slam Bray Wyatt. <laughs> and then a graphic that came up and said, Survivor Series is over. <laughs> Don't buy the show. There's what no the need. F- was this? They just, they destroyed the here. This was the end of the program, oh. as far as I'm concerned. Like, they killed all the heat here. What, what like, this was all was the that? revenge in one segment. Yeah. I mean, I thought they did a tremendous job with the Wyatts over the past several weeks, and uh, all of a sudden, there was no real explanation as to where Taker and Kane were, where their bodies were, uh, where they're escaping from. They overcame these attacks. They overcame the numbers disadvantage. They laid them out concise. Like, it was... There was no need after this for a match. You didn't need to get physical. I mean, even even when they... I feel like, okay, if you had to sacrifice Harper and Rowan, have them get taken out, that's fine. But 
The uh, Braun Strowman seems to be the monster that they're really trying to protect, and they kind of laid him out too. Uh, not as bad as they did Bray, but you know, you pretty much destroyed the entire team in a handicap advantage, uh, disadvantage. So, I thought they went way overboard here. The Undertaker is going to be at the SmackDown tapings this week. I would assume Kane is as well, so I guess you can do something there. Though, to be honest, the idea of Kane and Undertaker selling more at this point, I don't see as likely. And this was the same thing back in uh, 2001 during the invasion. They just like I don't under, just like killed if, everybody. At the most, like no one was dying to see these two beat four guys at Survivor Series, but now it's like they're already the, like. You need yeah. to get heat on these four as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And they just extinguished it in this segment. Yeah. I will say this. This tournament really – comparing it to how TNA started their tournament. I'm not saying TNA's oh tournament. Oh, my God. Come on. Night one. They at least knew they were doing a tournament when they were taping this. Listen, when <laughs> the first night of the TNA tournament coming out of Bound for Glory, I enjoyed that episode more than I did this episode. Really? I, I thought that this was just – it was somewhat uninspiring. And the final segment, Heat was awesome for the crowd, but... Oh, because they were seeing The Undertaker. That was yeah. it. It was an appearance pop and not yeah. so much building the Survivor Series in any way other than you're going to see The Undertaker wrestle. Right. I, I thought I enjoyed Raw today, uh, largely because, you know, every match seemed to have some value. All the wrestling on the show ran from pretty good to uh, very good in uh, Cesaro and Sheamus. And the show didn't drag for me. And in, in, in my books, that's a good show. All right. Well, that was raw. We had somewhat differing opinions. Uh, but as we look at the brackets way, what do you foresee being the finals? Finals. Is it going uh, to be Reigns and Ambrose? Is that the obvious? Or is someone else going to uh, I think, make it? I think Ambrose uh, and Reigns is certainly the, the match that has uh, a lot of story uh, line um, to it. I I feel like, though, Owens made a really great impression on this show, more so than Ambrose. So I would love to see uh, Reigns and Owens in the finals. That is possible. Who would you like to see leave as champion? Do you go with Reigns? What do you think is going to happen? I think Roman Reigns is winning. He wins. Yeah. And who is he feud coming out of this with? Owens? Did he mm. turn somebody? Oh, I haven't thought that. Before. Okay. I think we're out of time. Okay. Well, we got to get out of here. That is all for a Review of Raw. Way is going to spend the next week dissecting these brackets, yes. and he's going to have a booking plan next week. We're back on Wednesday with a new edition of Review Away, as we're going to be chatting ECW November to Remember 1999, and we'll speak with you next time on Review of Raw.